Hello. Uh, for those of you uh, joining us since I first introduced the three speakers, I'm Asher Miller, Assistant Research Curator in the Department of European Paintings here at the Met and Curator of the exhibition The Path of Nature. And my talk is entitled Scenic Roots, the Whitney Collection and 19th Century Art at the Met. The 50 paintings in the exhibition span a defining period in French history, beginning in the 1780s with the advent of the French Revolution and concluding soon after the abdication in 1848 of France's last king, Louis Philippe, or Louis Philippe d'Orléans. This remarkable collection underscores the role of the natural world as a source of inspiration for European artists living on the cusp of the modern era. The exhibition provides ample evidence of a rich tradition of painting out of doors, en plein air, nearly a century before Impressionism. Impressionism was not an inevitable outcome of plein air oil sketching, but there is something undeniably inexorable about the development of this practice. It emerged as a widespread, if somewhat peripheral activity in the late 18th century, only to take on an increasingly central role in successive movements from Romanticism to Realism and, eventually, Impressionism. This was recognized as early as the late 19th century. In 1886, on the occasion of the first exhibition of Impressionist paintings ever held in New York, the French art critic Theodore Dure, one of the movement's first champions, wrote as much. Here's an excerpt from the preface he wrote for the exhibition's catalog. Quote, the Impressionists are the descendants of the naturalist painters. Their fathers were Corot, Courbet, and Manet. And I want to interject here that the painting you see on the screen before you was painted by Corot 60 years before, in 1826, in Italy. But to continue with Duret's words, it is to these three masters, that is Corot, Courbet, and Manet, that the art of painting owes that simplicity of technique and that directness of touch, an execution proceeding by grand lines and by masses, which alone can stand the brunt of time. The Impressionists had borrowed from their immediate predecessors of the French school their honest way of painting in the open air, offhand, with vigorous touches. To these were added the bold and novel methods of color learned from the Japanese, and thus furnished, they began to develop their own individuality and to look at nature with their own eyes." End quote. Now, in studying each of the paintings in the Whitney collection over a period of three years and more, I continuously return to the same fundamental questions. What is this object? And what were the circumstances of its inception? In the essay I wrote for the current museum bulletin, I situated my, the, a majority of the paintings in the exhibition within a focused narrative that presents them somewhat parochially in their immediate historical context. It's easy to forget when one is looking at a work of art in an exhibition or reading about it in the accompanying literature how speculative the process of grappling with them was. So what I thought I would do today is to try to convey a bit of the feeling of speculation that can make research so compelling. To do that, I'm going to look at a handful of paintings in the Whitney Collection, and not only landscapes but figure paintings as well, through a wider scope. My selection is idiosyncratic and, may take, and, and might take subjective at times, so I beg your indulgence for that. What I hope to achieve by this is to propose ways in which they link up with other works in the Metropolitan's collection in order to expand on the rich narrative that unfolds on the walls of the museum. Now the two paintings that you see here have no historical connection to one another whatsoever and I readily admit make for a somewhat awkward juxtaposition. Yet keeping with their multiple and obvious differences front and center, I want to point out some parallels. On the left, you see a view of the town of Subiaco, which was probably painted by Alexandre Hyacinthe du Nuit. On the right is Claude Monet's La Grenouillère. The paintings are separated by about 80 years, and the sites they depict by about 800 miles. Du Nuit visited Subiaco, a village some 30 miles east of Rome in the 1780s. Although a few of his contemporaries are known to have visited there as well, undoubtedly drawn by tales of a Shangri-La-like valley a few miles beyond the better known town of Tivoli, it was not yet the popular artist's destination it would become in later decades. And in the exhibition, you'll see a painting by uh, Jean-Francois Montessuit of 1843, 
I'm not illustrating it here, uh, but it shows the interior of one of the major monasteries in Subiaco, or just outside the town. Dunui, whose style of painting may at first glance appear somewhat timid owing to its technical precision, was in fact quite intrepid, as a modern road to Subiaco was only completed in 1789, an event celebrated by no less than Pope Pius VI himself. Like Dunui, Monet also set out from the city center, Paris in his case, and by train, probably, in 1869, to investigate a subject that he had undoubtedly heard about from others and also read about in the popular press. La Grunière was a working class spa and resort that had recently been favored by a visit from Emperor Napoleon III and his family. Despite differences in the handling of paint, both works are studies. In a letter to his fellow painter, Frédéric Basile, Monet, probably referring to the work on the right as one of two pochades, or preliminary colored sketches, that he had made of the subject. The Dunuit and the Monet are both essentially studies of light, although they take very different approaches to the treatment of light working out of doors. Dunuit began with a piece of paper that he cut down to just over six inches high by 10 inches wide, that is, about one quarter the width of Monet's canvas. He began with a pencil drawing, uh, drawing in the myriad fine details of the town on its hill in the manner of a portrait, probably with the aid of an optical device called a camera obscura. It's a canny composition. Notice how the shape of the negative space of the sky inverts the shape of the village on its hill. Dunuit then proceeded to fill in the individual facades with assured washes of, co of color, of paint, resulting in a marvelously deft tonal study demonstrating the effect of contrajour or full sunlight that is highly atmospheric for so small a picture. In contrast to Dunuit's application of subtly differentiated tones using discrete brush strokes, Monet used broad constructive strokes to define his forms and simultaneously denote complementary areas of color as well as contrasting areas of light and shade. As radical a departure from Dunuit's method of painting as Monet's sketch is, his approach is not entirely unprecedented. Here on the left, you see a view of the edge of a wood by Theodore Carrel d'Aligny, an artist who bridges Dunuit's generation and Monet's, which is thought to have been painted about 1850 outside Paris. Like the Monet, it too emphasizes tonality and the dispersal of light at the expense of detail. It's an approach uh, that Aligny first employed in Italy in the 1820s alongside Camille Corot, and which he returned to throughout his long career. Aligny lived until 1871. The screen of trees, as seen in the Aligny, was a favorite motif of plein air painters in France at mid-century. It seemed to great effect in this little work on the left, a plein air sketch that the artist signed with his monogram at lower left, a sign that he was satisfied with its state of finish. The, the screen of trees is seen to equal effect on the far shore of the river Seine in Monet's sketch, and is one that Monet would return to in later works, as he does in The Four Trees of 1891, which is also in the Metz collection. And we're now far afield from Dunuit. But before moving on, I just want to point out that both he and Monet may be seen as improvising in another important respect, one that a slide doesn't convey. Just as Dunuit determined the size and proportions of his composition by cutting the sheet of paper on which he painted to suit it, Monet has done something quite similar in his choice of an unusual square format. For Dunuit, the use of paper in an improvised situation out of doors was largely a practical matter. Rivaling Dunuit's ingenuity and intrepidity, Monet rode himself to the middle of the river Ept, about a mile from his home at Giverny to paint the four trees, thereby posing both a problem and its own solution. Now, artists who, co who competed for the coveted Prix de Rome won a government-sponsored four-year -term, four term of study at the French Academy in Rome. There, they could immerse themselves in the remains of antiquity, which for many retained their status as the yardstick by which all cultural endeavor was measured well into the 19th century. Familiarity with the great monuments of the past was a prerequisite to study abroad, and artists brought with them to Italy a strong sense of what they would see once they got there. On the right, you see ancient Rome, which you may recall from Roberta's talk, a grand painting of 1757 in the museum's collection by Giovanni Paolo Panini, 
which neatly serves to demonstrate the variety and range of sights that an aspiring artist fully expected to see in the Eternal City and nearby. On the left, I'm showing a, a very little oil sketch in the Whitney Collection depicting a section of the Claudian Aqueduct in Rome, which was painted between 1826 and 1829 by André Giroux. In 1825, Giroux had been awarded the recently established Rome Prize in the category of historical landscape painting. Giroux's first teacher was his father, Alphonse Giroux, a former pupil of the neoclassical painter Jacques-Louis David, who went on to establish one of the most successful art supply shops in Paris. The younger Giroux might have seen this particular aqueduct in sketches and paintings by artists who had worked in Rome before him, and one finds its distinctive profile set into views by many of his contemporaries. Indeed, if you look in just the right place in the Panini, which I will help you with, first I'll put it there. Indeed, if you look just in the right place in the Panini, you may recognize it in a painting within his painting. Here is a detail showing that painting in its frame, surrounded by other works of art, including the famous Dying Gaul, a marble sculpture of the third century BC. You can see the aqueduct in its larger setting with the Palatine Hill at right, and here in a close-up detail. Looking at Giroux's study, it's easy to imagine the artist sketching away on a fair Roman day with the Colosseum behind him to his left and the open expanse of the Forum behind him to his right. But the emphatic centrality of the aqueduct's form in the Giroux exudes a pronounced sense of design and proportion that is surprising for so small a painting and that upends any notion of the artist entirely unfettered. The focus is simultaneously on the architecture rising from the verdure and the middle ground and the sky seen through and immediately surrounding it, resulting in a composition that is equal parts sought and found. The eye is drawn to the fluid materiality of the rapidly applied paint, that is, to the moment of its execution, which I submit took up a brief period of intense concentration on Giroux's part. In this respect, it recalls the counsel of the greatest French landscaper of the 18th century, Joseph Vernet, to an unnamed pupil, in a letter first published in 1817, not quite 10 years before Giroux arrived in Rome. Vernet wrote, quote, after having situated yourself, it is necessary to take as the subject of your drawing or your painting only what can be seen in a single glance, without shifting your head, because every time one moves it, only to notice some previously unnoticed things, one must begin as many new paintings, requiring alteration to the shapes of these things, their position, and consequently, the perspective itself. Now, in pairing the Giroux sketch with Jacques-Louis David's Oath of the Horatii in the Louvre of 1785, which you see on the right, I want merely to suggest the possibility that even in the open air and miles from Rome, Giroux was not totally untethered from all that he knew. The Horatii, set in what may be considered the most famous interior in modern painting, then modern painting, with its emphatic frontality and symmetry, could well have been on his mind as he sketched away. And I just wish to point out that David had died in Brussels on December 29, 1825, while Giroux was en route to Rome, that in 1826, the Horatii was moved from the Museum of Living Artists in the Luxembourg Palace in Paris to the Louvre, so without insisting upon it, I can't help but wonder whether Giroux made the correspondence himself, even subliminally. And since I'm alluding to the coincidence of symmetry between the Horatii and Giroux's sketch, I may as well note the studied asymmetry of another painting, David, as it also coincides with Giroux's sketch. The Death of Socrates in the Metz Collection, a painting of 1787, also regained notoriety at this juncture, as it featured in the most notable exhibition held in Paris in 1826, the David Memorial Exhibition held by the Galerie Le Brun, which was organized to benefit the cause of Greek independence from the Ottoman Empire. But as we're now on a somewhat slippery art historical slope, and rather than dwell on it long enough for you to object, I will <laughs> move on. The intermingling of nature and architecture seen in Giroux's sketch was an important ingredient of Rome's unique and special character and was a mainstay of depictions of the city and its environs. In this view from the Villa d'Este Tivoli by Simon Denis, which you see uh, on the left and in a detail on the right, the distinctive dabs of paint that describe structures and vegetation alike are virtually indistinguishable upon close inspection. 
With the detail on the right, I mean to um, emphasize the arches of the bridge in the center of the vista, which you see there in the whole painting, um, which is called the Ponte Lucano, which Denis has here taken the liberty of multiplying. The arch has, I believe, three uh, arches, and here he's sort of elongated it uh, to fit in his landscape. The appeal of the classical tradition of the conventions of picturesque view making as embodied by French artists of the 17th and 18th centuries were by no means lost on later painters, the Impressionists included, despite their ceaseless search for novelty. In his own words, Cezanne aimed, quote, to make of Impressionism something solid and durable like the art of museums, end quote. In his Mont Saint Victoire and the Viaduct of the Arc River Valley of 1882, which you see on the right here in the Metz collection, he imparts something of this wish in the form of a, of a resolutely modern marvel, a railroad viaduct, which stands in handily for a Roman bridge or aqueduct. Now, Italy was not the only source of tradition in landscape painting. Pierre-Henri de Valenciennes, who made sketches in Italy in the early 1780s that are considered to be masterpieces of their type, also made at least 10 such works in Brittany, possibly as early as 1785, evidence of one of the earliest plein air excursions along the Channel Coast. The work you see here depicts the banks of the river Rance. Painted quickly, it is both candid and informal. It was not painted for eventual exhibition and was, in fact, an exercise intended to train the artist's eye and hand so that later on in the studio he would have a well of experience to draw from when he executed larger, more finished paintings. You see it here alongside a formal view of the city of Brest, a port on the Atlantic coast of the Breton Peninsula, not very far from where Valenciennes painted his sketch. Henri-Joseph de Blarenberg painted it in 1773 in order to complete an official commission left unfinished by Joseph Vernet, whom I mentioned earlier. Vernet was an artist Valenciennes had met and very much admired. Valenciennes' sketch was painted not as a preparatory step in a project such as the one exemplified by the picture on the right, however. Although the subject is identifiably the banks of the Rance, it was recognized as such nearly two centuries after it was painted by a French art historian. Valenciennes' aim was not strictly topographical. Instead, he challenged himself to paint the fleeting effects presented by the circumstances in which he found himself. The haze in the sky is depicted with paint so thinly applied that the white of the paper shows through. By contrast, it is reflected in the water by means of white pigment mixed with the blue paint. Indeed, Valenciennes' power of observation may be divined by the way in which he maneuvered his brush in a combination of dabs, lines, and comma-like strokes to record the water's ripples, swirls, and eddies visible in the photomicrograph detail that you now see on the right, an image for which I wish to thank my colleague, Met Paintings Conservator Charlotte Hale. Confirmation of what Valenciennes took away from the experience of painting this sketch is found in the treatise on painting he published in 1800, Elements de Perspective Pratique, in which he describes the movement of shallow water over submerged rocks in words that echo very closely what you see in the detail here. Valenciennes' study was intended as an exercise to enhance his own personal development as a painter, but its sketch-like appearance and its informality had no place in finished paintings in the decades on either side of 1800. The aesthetics of the sketch had yet to become a central feature of progressive painting. On the right, I'm showing On the Beach, Sunset, a painting of 1865 by Eugène Boudin. In its informality, if its informality recalls Valenciennes' sketch, then this was very much wrapped up in its subject as well, which includes haute bourgeois vacationers in a newly fashionable resort, Trouville or possibly Dovi, farther east on the Channel Coast in Normandy. But if Boudin was attentive to the fleeting aspects of beach couture, he was equally attentive to qualities of light and atmosphere which he recorded in preparatory sketches not unlike Valenciennes, and which served much the same purpose as his predecessors. Boudin's paintings, admirable as they are on their own merits, are, however, somewhat overshadowed today by those of his young emulator, Claude Monet, who soon surpassed him. On the right, you see Monet's regatta at saint Dress, which was painted two years after the Boudin in 1867. It's also in the Metz collection. As a picture painted out of doors on an exhibition-sized canvas, it handily demonstrates one of the key distinctions between the ambitions of painters sketching en plein air of Valenciennes' generation and those of the Impressionist generation. 
Valenciennes would not have fathomed Monet's painting for its subject, its size, or its lack of finish. We know nothing about Valenciennes' sense of humor either, but it is a safe bet that he would have winced at Monet's slightly cheeky placement of the seated woman at lower left, whose L-shaped form echoes the corner of the canvas. Moreover, Valenciennes had approached plein air painting as a means to execute studies, but not finished paintings. He counseled his followers to limit their plein air sketches to no more than two hours per sitting, and significantly less during morning or late afternoon. He wrote, quote, it is absurd for an artist to spend a whole day copying a single view from nature, end quote. Heeding his own counsel, Monet suffered from the glare he endured while painting at saint Address, writing to Frederick Basile on July 3rd, 1867, quote, I'm losing my sight. I can barely see after working for half an hour. The doctor told me that I had to stop painting out of doors, end quote. Ten days later, he felt better, writing, I'm working constantly. My eyes are better thanks to the sun not coming out for several days now. While Valenciennes' aim was to capture transient aspects of nature, Monet was, like Cezanne, seeking something simultaneously transient and permanent. So now I'm turning to figure painting. And here you see a cabinet-sized picture by Auguste Xavier Le Prince, who lived a very short life. He was born in 1799 and died in 1826. Uh, and here you see a cabinet-sized picture in the Whitney collection known as Man in Oriental Costume in the Artist's Studio. It was painted about uh, probably 1823-26. Most of Laplace's sitters seem to have been more or less like the art painter himself, elegant Parisians of the middle class. The identity of the model depicted here and the circumstances that brought him to the artist's studio, however, remain unknown. Beginning with Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1798, French artists from Giraudet to Jericho had relished the opportunity to paint figures in Middle Eastern dress. Laplace's interest in this pensive man may have stemmed from the War of Independence being waged by Greeks against the Ottoman Turks in the 1820s. The subject caught and held the attention of a broad array of artists in the 20s, including Eugène Delacroix, whose scenes from the massacre at Chios was completed for the Salon of 1824. Delacroix's studio was visited by numerous artists who were able to see the painting as it developed, possibly including Le Prince. And so here I'm showing a watercolor study for his painting. Uh, both the painting and the study are in the Louvre. Note the figure with his head in his hand at the far left, who was omitted from the final painting, but who may have been part of the composition as it, as it, as it developed. Now, what do we really know about Le Prince's subject? Little can be said about it definitively. Is it an evocation of melancholy derived from Albrecht Durer's iconic engraving of 1514, Melancholia I, seen here in an impression from the Metz collection, which was indeed a touchstone for artists of the Romantic generation? Perhaps. Laplace tended to feature studio props in his independent portraits and was working on an animated group portrait of artists and others in his atelier at the time he died in 1826. But why he chose to situate this particular figure there, with the emblems of his own work so prominently on display and seemingly integrated into the model's persona is another question that invites speculation. Not precisely a portrait in the conventional sense, it is also not yet a historical genre picture like the one depicting Michelangelo in his studio that Delacroix would paint a quarter century later in 1849-50, the painting now in the Musée Fabre Montpellier, uh, which you see on the right. The precise subject of Le Prince's painting remains open to speculation, but in this regard, it is in good company, as it may anticipate central questions about the painting now on the right, known as the Collector of Prints, which Edgar Degas painted in 1866. It's also in the Metz collection. Clearly, this is a portrait, but of whom? Was he a model for hire or someone Degas knew? Is the absence of his identity deliberate or is it an accident of history? Is it a portrait or a genre picture or a hybrid? So from a subject lost, I now want to uh, conclude this presentation with a series of images that represent a subject regained or fleshed out. Here is a painting you no doubt recognize from a few minutes ago by Franz Ludwig Cattell, which is thought to date to the first half of the 1820s. Cattell was actually German, but he was born into a family of French Protestants, Huguenots, who lived in Berlin 
and he trained under the sculptor Jean-Antoine Houdon at the École des Beaux-Arts in Paris between 1798 and 1800, returning to Paris in 1807, remaining there for four years before finally moving on to Rome, where he died in 1856. The subject of this painting, A Child's First Steps, may at first seem to be of no more than lighthearted and sentimental interest. But in the course of working on the exhibition, I came to understand that it is one of far greater resonance. At some point, I came across the reproduction of the painting you see on the right in black and white reproduction. I couldn't find a good color. It's called Les Premiers Pas d'Enfance, or The First Ch Steps of Childhood. It's by the Swiss painter Jacques Sablé. Painted in 1789 and exhibited at the Paris Salon of 1796, it is credited with being the first treatment of everyday life to be set in modern Italy by an artist of the French school. And I just love the detail of the older boy picking out a tune on his mandolin to accompany the child as he makes his way tentatively across the table. It's possible, although not certain, that Cattell saw the Sable before moving to Italy in 1811, and it is also possible that he saw it later in Rome as part of the collection assembled by Napoleon's uncle, Cardinal Fesch, who first owned it, or who may not be the first owner, but, but who owned it after, uh, certainly after 1815. And here you see a rather more grand and high-minded treatment of a related theme, the three ages of man, now in the Musée Condé in Chantilly, just outside of Paris. It was painted by François Gérard in 1808 and exhibited at the Paris Salon that year. Cattell undoubtedly saw it at the Salon, and as with the painting by Sablé, he may have seen it again in Italy, for it was acquired by Napoleon's sister, Caroline Murat, who took it with her to Naples when she assumed the throne there as the consort of Napoleon's general, Joachim Murat. Note that Gérard's picture evokes the Bay of Naples with the profile of Vesuvius on the right. Different as they are, in the Cattell as in the Gerard, the underlying message of continuity between generations is essentially the same. In the Cattell, the stability of the architecture and the distant landscape, its bounty on display and the still life with vegetables at lower left, served as a classic setting for this family, whose immediate bonds and more distant connection to antiquity combined to evoke the classical allegory of the ages of man. In fact, it was the still life in the lower left corner of the Cattell that came to mind one day when I passed the painting on our right in the galleries, the Natchez, which Eugène Delacroix began as early as 1822 and which he finally exhibited at the Salon of 1835. Delacroix typically included still lifes in a corner of the foreground of his historical and literary subjects, and although he was hardly unique in this respect, in his case, there is often something desultory about them that serves as a counterpoint to the central subject. My point in bringing up Delacroix's still life in the present context is that it was only once I had thought of it in connection with Cattell's that I noticed the similarity of the painting's respective subjects. Both depict a tender family moment drawn from literature. Delacroix's is based on Atala, Chateaubriand's immensely influential novel of 1801 and both are peculiarly French treatments of themes rendered somehow more innocent for being acted out by exotic types, Native Americans, in the case of Delacroix, and, for Cattell, modern but picturesque Italian counterparts of heroic forebears in antiquity. The landscapes are easy to overlook in both pictures, too, but just as Cattell conveys the very essence of Italy's eternal beauty in his, Delacroix evokes the vastness of the American wilderness here on the banks of the Mississippi. The subject continued to have legs throughout the 19th century. Here you see a version in the Metz collection painted by Vincent van Gogh in 1890, which is based on an 1858 drawing by Jean-Francois Millet that van Gogh owned a photo of. And I end now with Honoré Daumier's Londres of about 1863. Rather than taking precisely the same subject as Cattell's painting, it represents a significant updating of the theme. The motif is brought home to the instantly recognizable case of Paris, and this mother is hardly the vision of eternal loveliness seen in the Cattell. She works, and she works hard, poised between stooping from the weight of her load and leaning down to tenderly hold her daughter's hand. In her other hand, the girl holds not some toy, but a laundry paddle. The figures, the figures maintain their dignity and thereby endure, withstanding any and all attempts to sentimentalize them. And there's no return to the innocent world of Cattell's peasants here. Thank you.